Welcome to the Michigan Golfer Show. Join us each week as we explore the people, the places, and the events that shape our great game. Hi, I'm Jenny McCafferty for the Michigan Golfer, and today we're with Jim Nelson, who some of us might acknowledge as the official historian of Washtenaw Golf Club, formerly known as Washtenaw Country Club. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, it sure is. In fact, it's almost as though your family has had an affair with this golf club going way back. Quite a ways back. Yeah. Right, yeah. Your dad was uh, chairman of the 50th anniversary celebration? He was, yes. I, that story, my parents uh, came to Michigan in, uh, around 1935 from New Jersey. and uh, They were living in Detroit. and. Um, my dad worked for the Rexall Drug Company and he uh, was calling on the local Rexall Drug Store in Ypsilanti and uh, one of the owners there brought him out to see Washtenaw Country Club. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of it for him. <laughs> uh, they, he almost immediately joined Washtenaw and they moved to Ypsilanti. Oh, no kidding. Right. That's, that's pretty cool. And, and your mom has her own place in Michigan golf history. Tell us a little bit about what she did. Well, Mary, her name Mary, is Mary. Mary Nelson, yeah. She was, uh, um, of course, played golf here and uh, was active in the women's group here at Washtenaw. And then I was in high school, so I think it was uh, in the uh, late idea came about starting a Michigan women's senior tournament. And their biggest concern was whether or not they could get women to admit that they were more than 50 years old <laughs> in, order, in order to play in the tournament. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so uh, I can remember, you know, I'd be, come home and I'd say, oh, we got another 10 entrants today. <laughs> and uh, so they started here at Washington and, and the inaugural event was very, very successful and they formed the Michigan Women's uh, golf Association and um, and my mother was elected to be the first president of that. So. Wow, that's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. So two movers and shakers, if you will. Well, yeah, they participated here, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Well, and carrying on, you yourself were chairman of the Centennial Celebration. Correct, yeah. See, probably by default they knew <laughs> that my dad had been uh, <coughs> chairman in, yeah. in uh, 1949. So, yeah. Right. So yeah, it was a great uh, kind of honor for me to do that, and, yeah. you know, especially because of my dad's history. Yeah. And this book really celebrates the centennial. Tell us a little bit about how the book itself came to be. <coughs> well, I think that um, when we started that process of trying to figure out what we would do with the uh, 100th anniversary, we thought that it was really important to try to uh, capsulize the, the history in, in one in one place. And um, we were very, very fortunate. Um, Bill Sliger, who had been a long time member here at Washtenaw, uh, was the, ran the newspaper in Northville and was in the printing business. And um, Bill agreed to uh, head up the uh, effort to do that book. And uh, it would not look like it does <laughs> came out if it hadn't been for Bill and his expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he he really coordinated the whole thing and put it together. And um, I mean, I think it came out pretty, pretty well. Well, the book itself has been a great resource for all the stories we've been trying to do on the course mm -hmm. to celebrate the right. 125th. This is coming up soon. Right. Yeah. 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 Another it's another mark in the history of Washington. Right. 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 Well, some some of the things that always strike me is this place was old enough that in the in the old days, sheep were in charge of cutting the grass. Yeah. <laughs> I never saw the sheep. I know. <laughs> <But> <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the other things that I thought was kind of funny in the, in the olden days is that the caddies, their job was to carry clubs, mm -hmm. to find the ball, and to chase the sheep off the greens. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. And I mean, through the 
you know, later history of Washtenaw caddies were an important part mm -hmm. of uh, what went on here because they, they had a strong caddy program and uh, we had at least one uh, um, young man that was about the same age as I growing up, uh, Chuck Barnes, who became, uh, was selected uh, to be a cat caddy and received an Evans scholarship to attend the University of Michigan. So. Oh, okay, yeah. And the Evans scholarships are for caddies. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We we met with some caddies who uh, at French Lick Resort who were mm -hmm. caddies when they were little kids, and now they're old enough to tell good stories. <laughs> and so it's always fun to talk to people who used to be the caddies. Yeah, it's pretty cool. One of the people who's um, kind of important here is Ken McLaughlin. He's the uh, he was Lower described man. in this book like 25 years ago as a veteran gardener. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really distinguishes Washington Golf Club is the landscaping and the flowers. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, he does a wonder wonderful job. And uh, yeah. it, it, it's nice to just drive in and see the, the beds around the clubhouse. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. Yeah they, yeah, they always are, and it changes with the seasons. Mm -hmm. McLaughlin who's always busy because he takes care of all the flowers. And I don't think any golf club has prettier flowers. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's, it's something that's, that's disappearing uh, from golf courses in general, I hear. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Well, you wouldn't know it here. They're in, they're in front as you drive in. They're all around the clubhouse. They're all around the course. So how did you first get interested in flowers? Well, a um, long time ago, about 30 years ago, when I started here, I was just a member of the crew, mm -hmm. and I was uh, did flowers about part half the day and worked on the crew the other half. Okay. And they all they had was annuals at the time. This was decades ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just asked my boss one day, what do you think about we switch the general theme up of in including some shrubs and perennials and mm -hmm. make it a little more complex and he agreed and off I went. I went to the Master Gardener classes here in Ann no Arbor. Kidding. Yes. Wow. And uh, just found a love for it and continued. So you find all different colors, all different shapes, all different, I mean, some are little, some are tall. Mm -hmm. How do you go about picking the right flower for the place? Like right behind us. Well, uh, essentially it's first I think about light how much light the plants need if, yeah. and if this area will have that mm -hmm. and then there's soil uh, drainage mm -hmm. things of that nature and then as you're pr progressing into the garden you're mixing colors textures mm -hmm. plants have different texture leaves have different texture mm -hmm. all those things you combine in an element that is pleasing to the eyes so all that stuff you think about so we don't have to. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, it's always a treat to come. Even though we're here several times a week, I always notice something different. So congratulations on making it such a fun experience. Well, thanks very much. It's my pleasure. I wanted to talk about this group of people who are mentioned in the book called the old guys, which I think is kind of a funny way to describe anybody. And never mind trying to find them in women over 50. Right. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that group. It met Tuesday through Sunday at 10.30 a.m. for quite a long time. Yeah, and I think it just was a, a situation where um, uh, a group, uh, I don't know, there may have been 20 or so of them, uh, were at an age where they, they were retired and mm -hmm. uh, and golf was an important part of their life and they had been uh, uh, playing here at Washington for a long time and uh, it, uh, I think it just formed uh, and developed uh, without any um, you know real structure to it uh, mm -hmm. it's just that everybody sh showed up and they made their groups up and off they went mm -hmm. yeah I think having an um, appointed time every week really helps because you don't have to call people up and make appointments and arrange tea times. Yeah, it just right. happens. Yeah, one of the really wonderful things about Washington over the years was that 
you could always come to Washtenaw and get a game. I mean, there was there were no uh, real clicks. Uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, you could just say you didn't have to worry about uh, tea time. You knew there was a group that's going to play at nine o'clock, and you could mm -hmm. show up, and you'd be welcome to play. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's been somewhat interesting is it's Washtenaw's gone from private to public and back again several times. Have you noticed much of a difference when the club changes from public to private and back again? Well, I guess I would answer by saying, first of all, most of my history it was a private club. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I've always thought of it as a private club, and I actually continue to think of it as kind of a private club. Again, golf show, and we're here at the Polo Fields booth with John Myers, who's the head golf professional of now. You've got more than one course. Yes. Tell us about all the excitement that's been happening there, John. Well, it's uh, it's a lot of excitement for us this year. Uh, being bought out, Washtenaw Country Club, it's long-standing traditional golf course uh, was bought out by the Polo Fields this year. So not only do you get a fine golf course in the Polo Foods Fields by uh, Bill Newcomb, but now also you get a classic, classic golf course in Washtenaw Country Club. And I think that course, uh, the Washtenaw Country Club course, is uh, more than 100 years old, isn't it? Correct. It was established in 1899, been around for a long time. Donald Ross did oversee some of the work out there. and. Uh, it's just your classic traditional golf course. It's one that you can't find anymore in the state of Michigan, really. Um, so from my own perspective, it, it hasn't changed, uh, especially since Dave Kendall and his uh, group uh, acquired the club. Um, uh, we, there are a group of us that still think of ourselves as members, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. quite sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there are some, uh, some differences, uh, but uh, it uh, operates pretty much the same for me in my life. Yeah, so I think one of the significant things about a club or um, a group of people who co keep coming and playing is you know a lot of people. Everybody knows your name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. There's always been a group, and that kind of I think one of the goes back to when Tom Talkington came here as a, as the pro in the early '50s. I mean, Tom did an awful lot to develop golf at, at this club and, uh, and he was responsible for kind of forming some groups that okay. have lasted over the years and uh, um, but that's the way Washington has been there's there's always been a group that you could play with and you knew everybody and, uh, yeah. and uh, it was uh, it's, it's made it a very comfortable place to be in the uh, men's invitational mm -hmm. started here at Washington okay. which turned out to be uh, one of the best invitationals in the state of Michigan. It was okay. different than almost anybody else's. It was a four-man teams, and uh, um, and Tom just promoted golf. And uh, if there was an event, I mean, you'd walk into the pro shop and he said, "Have you signed up yet for you know this weekend?" And, okay. Uh, it wasn't that was important. I mean, to get okay. people participate. So you recruited people for this. Sure yeah. He yeah. sure did. He sure did. And. Sometimes clubs have tournaments on Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day. It seems to be a typical time for tournaments. Was that true here? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, big, big events. I mean, okay. and, and most of those events were uh, couples events. Oh, okay. I mean, mixed events. Wow. And uh, I think one of the interesting things was that they would have this an event, we'll say, on the Fourth of July, and mm -hmm. it would be. Uh, uh, maybe four or five member teams and, and they would be made up of, you know, just various aspects of the membership. I mean, the pro shop, I think, put the teams together and uh, and I always thought that the most interesting thing was that the, the very best men's players always participated in those events. Oh, okay. Now that makes a difference when the good guys are, yeah. you know, everybody wants, everybody's out to beat them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, that you mentioned couples, and one of the things I was struck by was the extent to which women have always had a really strong presence here. In fact, of the original 99 members, 11 of them were women. That had to be unusual. 
Well, I think it was unusual, and, and you're right, it was a very important and maybe sometimes overlooked uh, mm -hmm. uh, factor here at Washtenaw. Um, uh, Lynn Whitmire, who was a uh, charter member of the club and, mm -hmm. and remained a member for the rest of her life, um, I think was a really, really important part of Washtenaw because I, you may have seen all of the scrapbooks that have mm -hmm. um, been um, prepared. I've seen over, inside all of them, but right, I've seen them all out right, on a table. table yeah. right, and, and well, the, a lot of those are made up of newspaper articles. Okay. And in those days, you could write your article and take it to the newspaper mm -hmm. and they would publish it. Well, I would say that probably 90% of those and all of those books were written by Lynn Whitmire. Okay. And, uh, you know, published in the, in the Ypsilanti Press. Mm -hmm. And you, when you think about it, I mean, the press has always been an important thing. And if you're, yeah. you have an organization and every week mm -hmm. there's an article or more, even more than one article in the newspaper about your organization. Yeah. That's good, right? That's, that's, in a way, that's marketing. It, great marketing, yeah. right? right. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. And so I think that uh, is really true. Another uh, factor in terms of women's participation was with the junior program. Mm -hmm. It was really the women that, uh, that ran the junior, okay. junior program. And so particularly in my memory, uh, uh, Doris Greenstreet and, and Lil mm -hmm. Dobbs, um, both of whom had children here, um, kind of started the junior program, okay. and um, it really was a wonderful program. Uh, and not only it did involve not only golf, but I mean we elected officers and mm -hmm. you know kind of ran our little junior golf association ourselves. So you were really one of the mainstays of the junior golf program here. You know we've had a lot of great players come out of this area. I mean, you got Doug Davis, the Ream boys, mm -hmm. Jeff and Frank Ream, the Mears, Kev. I mean, we've had a lot. Jeff Dobbs won the state championship in high school. I won the state championship in high school. More than My once. brother Tim. <laughs> I mean, we I mean, just, this was a, a hotbed for junior. Ed Humanick, who played on the tour for eight years. You know, just a lot of really good players came yeah. out of here. Well, that sounds Actually, it sounds more complicated than it might seem because not only are you recruiting kids, but you, you have to teach them how to play golf. Yeah, right. And again, I mean, it, it, I, I mentioned those two by name because they kind of headed it up. But mm -hmm. I mean, every uh, junior day, I mean, there, there were plenty of women here who were, they had to walk with the, the little kids and, okay. you know, try to teach them. Not so much golf, maybe, but at least the etiquette of yes. golf. Yes, <laughs> that's that's a huge story of golf, that's isn't right, it? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Well, during the time that you've been here, you've probably known quite a few of the pros. How, how about someone like Jim Applegate? Well, Jim, uh, you know, kind of followed. Uh, I mean. Really, in my, I mean, I knew Larry Pentuck. He was just here for a year or two, and then Tom Talkington had a long um, stay here at Washtenaw, mm -hmm. and, and then Randy Erskine came mm -hmm. along. And, and Jim, I think, maybe followed Randy. He was close someplace in that yeah. pecking order. And, I mean, one of Jim's characteristics was that he was a great manager. I mean, he mm -hmm. everything ran really, uh, you know, kind of, he was a perfectionist, I think. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you were having a tournament, you might find that all of the golf carts were out there in a perfect circle, you know, <laughs> when, when to start, to start yeah. the day. And yeah. uh, everything was done just exactly right. And mm -hmm. uh, I think at one point, uh, Jim was hoping maybe he could become the general manager and run the whole club. And mm -hmm. it might have been a good idea if that had happened, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. Jim was a, a really good person and did a good job here. Mm -hmm. Well, the year is going to have several facets of him that done himself. Well, Randy sure was uh, special. I mean, of course, he was a special golfer to begin with and had a you know, history of, uh, of playing good golf at, at a very high level. And then, of course, he had a great personality. And, uh, and he had Judy, too, his wife. <laughs> and, uh, she participated uh, heavily in running the pro shop, and okay. I think uh, you know, mm -hmm. doing the buying and marketing of the mm -hmm. pro shop. And so yeah, Randy was a, a, a wonderful asset to have at Washington.
What about in, in all those amateur victories, what was one that stood out more than maybe any of the other? Well, I, I have to say it was the Michigan medal play at, at Washtenaw Country Club because uh, I really never knew if I could win anything until I actually did. Nobody knows that. And once you go through the experience of winning, it helps your your momentum for future tournaments. So that first win, and then the next few years after that, I won the Michigan Amateur. So then I knew that I could play within Michigan, but I didn't have any idea that I could play nationally also, which came about later on. Yeah. Randy and Judy live next door to us. Mm -hmm. And after they left and some other people moved in, we were talking to them about Randy and lights went off and they said, oh, that's why there are 16 foot ceilings in the house, so he can swing a club. <laughs> yeah. How about Jeff Cummings, another one who was a pro? <coughs> well, Jeff was here for a fairly short period of time, okay. and uh, he was here uh, during one of the situations where there was a real bad storm right before the women's invitational, and a lot of trees came down. and. Uh, so I've, in my memory, I kind of remember, you know, Jeff was out there with a chainsaw helping cut, oh, up, wow. <laughs> cut up the trees and get them off the fairway so, wow. so they could actually play the tournament. Uh, uh, so uh, he, would <coughs> he was a, a, a friendly person, and, and I, but only here for, I think, a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, another one that comes to mind is Tom Deaton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tom Deaton came here, I think, primarily to be an instructor. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, he had been a longtime pro at, uh, I think, at Franklin Hills Country Club and, uh, um, <coughs> and retired maybe from there, I'm not sure. And, and so you would mostly see Tom down on the pra okay. practice tee giving lessons. Okay. Uh, that seemed to be his main role during the yeah. period of time he was here. And that was also for a fairly short period of time, maybe yeah. a year or so. Well, it's interesting that you mention instruction, and that's obviously got to be part of it. Every golfer, no matter how, even the pros, always practice and always try to get better. And who are some of the other people who've been responsible for instruction here? Wow. Um, well, it, of course, it was almost always the the pros yeah. that were doing it. Um, again, I, I go back to Tom, Tom Talkington. Uh, he had a, an assistant, Gary Carley, who eventually became the head pro at uh, the leading country club in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and both of them were good, good instructors. Uh, it was harder back then because there was no practice range. Oh. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> You had, you had to go down here, like maybe next to number 18 green, and hit balls out into the <laughs> into the fairway, and yeah. had to have caddies out there picking up the balls. So, uh, but all of the pros I think that were here were instructors, mm -hmm. and uh, some yeah. some probably better than others. Yeah. Well, the practice range now didn't there used to be a pool there? Correct. There was a swimming pool right out here in, yeah. in front of where we're sitting, yeah. and. Uh, so um, I think that pool was built around 1952 or three, mm -hmm. and um, uh, was there um, for well, it was still there when my my kids were growing up in the, yeah. uh, in the 70s, um, <coughs> and it was it, actually they started a, a small practice range even when the pool was there, mm -hmm. and then it, were able to enlarge it when the pool was removed. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so <coughs> I think originally the the first tee for Washington was more in front of where we're sitting, so that's why there wasn't room for a practice range. So okay. when they moved the tee over, then it made more space. Okay. okay. And then they opened another smaller pool up front and closed that recently. Correct. Yeah. 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 I think after this pool was taken out, it, there may have been a a few years without a pool and the idea was that you know a country club should have a pool yeah. and uh, <laughs> so a new pool was constructed right? yeah right. yeah and there were tennis courts at one point, point there were two yes where right. were they well they were uh, just to the uh, 
east of where the pool where the pool was out here. But oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's there have been a number of people who have been through the years the movers and shakers of the club, um, and some characters. And one of the ones who comes to mind is Ben Taylor, who was the manager of the men's, men's locker, locker room. room. Ben was very special, right? <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of things, probably a lot of stories that could be told about Ben, but uh, I'll tell you my favorite story. Okay. So, um, they, uh, <coughs> Ben was here when they uh, redid the locker room, and so we, we all got new lockers at that point. And um, so <coughs> Ben came to me one day and he said, Mr. Nelson, he said, I don't want you ever to forget your combination for your locker. He said, so I'm going to write it right here inside your locker. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was Ben. This is a great place in case your locker's a lot. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Well, some of the other people, you already mentioned uh, Randy Erskine. Mm -hmm. How about Shirley Spork? Well, I only know that Shirley Spork by name. Um, okay. You know, she, uh, she participated in the uh, uh, exhibition that they had for the 50-year uh, mm -hmm. anniversary. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I, I think she was a young, maybe a student at Eastern or oh. Michigan at the time, okay. and but she went on to, you know, have a, a career in golf and, and yeah. play, I think, on the women's tour even. Yeah. But uh, I, I I really didn't know her or, or ever. I don't yeah. think I ever saw her. But she was a name that people knew. Right. Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah. Well, the club has some pretty dramatic events, including a big fire in 1987. Mm -hmm. What happened to people playing golf when the club itself had a big fire? Well, really nothing happened to the people playing golf. Um, the, uh, they set up a, what I guess today would be called a food truck uh, oh. <laughs> down near number 10 T. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so you were, I mean, the golf course was open the whole time and it, no, there was no interference in terms of golf. Uh, and the uh, people that ran the food truck were, I mean, they, they were serving mostly, you know, sandwiches and hamburgers <laughs> and that sort of thing, but you could get food and you could get um, beverages. And uh, some people thought that that was one of the best times at Washington. <laughs> In that uh, during that period of time while the club was, house was being reconstructed. Yeah. Well, when, it, when something that dramatic happens, is there a committee of people who get together and plan a new building, or what happened? Well, there, you know, Washington has always been, was, as a private club, was operated by a board of directors, <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, there was a board, and yes, I mean, and it, there was a lot of planning that okay. had to go on, and, and I think that uh, during that period of time, there was probably uh, a lot of uh, ideas uh, as mm -hmm. to what should happen um, in terms of rebuilding. And um, I think fortunately, the clubhouse was rebuilt more or less like the original. Okay. Um, it um, doesn't have an upstairs that the original had, but mm -hmm. um, it kept the same footprint, and okay. of course, both ends were still here after the fire. I mean, the women. So it's just the middle that burned. Yeah, the middle is the part that burned. Yeah. And, uh, what happened to trophies and things like that? Well, they, those were pretty much preserved. Okay. I, I think. I mean, there are, uh, some of the trophies are now on display in, in the pro shop, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think that there was too much in the way of loss there. Um, mm -hmm. And. Uh, and all of the history of the club was pretty well maintained. I mean, the, all of those uh, scrapbooks and things were mm -hmm. in the office, which was upstairs and was not affected by the fire. So okay. uh, I don't think there was a great deal of loss except for the structure. Yeah, yeah. So meanwhile, we're looking out and the sun has come out and the course, as usual, looks just beautiful. Talk a little bit about the course and what are some of your favorite holes? 
Well, I thought you would probably ask me how the course had changed. <laughs> okay, I'll ask you how the course had changed. <laughs> years, but, uh, <laughs> the, uh, for me, the, sort of the big changes over the years, one was, when, uh, was irrigation when they started to water, uh, mm -hmm. had the ability to water all of the fairways. Um, and, um, and then, of course, the trees, everybody talks about the trees on Washington, and uh, a lot of them, uh, some of them were planted uh, when I was a child, and I saw them all grow mm -hmm. up, uh, like the willow. So the trees well, grow up. Willow yeah. trees down here <laughs> on seven and eight, and yeah. um, um, and then there's been a change over the years in the the creek that goes through Washington is Paint Creek, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just a natural creek, and there were not much in the way of ponds, and uh, I think it was probably in the 70s when the uh, uh, drain commission actually they wanted to put the whole creek in a pipe and run it through here mm -hmm. and um, Dick Roberts was pretty uh, instrumental in negotiating with the drain commission and, and that resulted in us getting some ponds and re maintaining most of the natural creek that came came okay. through the club so uh, no that, pipe that no no pipe mm -hmm. and uh, and so nice pond in front of 18 and a pond down in front of number seven and uh, uh, so those were you know changes that took place and then I, on holes 15 and 16 when I was a young person here there were, there was no pond on 15 and 16 there might have been a pond in the spring but during, <laughs> yeah. during the summer there was no, no pond there so um, that was one of the big changes when they actually um, started pumping water in there mm -hmm. and created a, a, a permanent pond. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in terms of favorite holes, gee, uh, I mean, this is a wonderful golf course. I mean, uh, all of the holes are, are really great holes. I think, uh, for me, one of the hardest holes is number 17. Um, it's a fairly long par four, and then when you get on the green, you're you can be in a lot of trouble on the green. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, uh, you're you're right about a, it's beautiful all up and down, and a lot of that does have to do with the landscaping and the trees. Mm -hmm. And I think the trickiest part about trees on a golf course is they grow. They sure do. And I know when Ray Hearn came in, some of the trees mm -hmm. aren't here anymore. I got this message from Ray Hearn, and it's uh, and I call him back, and I get a recorder, and it says Ray Hearn Golf Associates. So, I finally we get hooked up. He comes in. I said, Ray, you're in the golf business. What do you do? Oh my gosh! Long pause. I'm a golf course architect. Okay, so this hole, number 14, par 3, plays uh, about 180, depending on which tee, tee position you play from. The left side, um, a couple years ago, I took out 15 or 16 trees, big, big, old black oaks and hickories. Um, at one point, you could not hit a fade. If you're right-hander, you couldn't hit a fade on this hole. 
now we open it up and you can curve a little fade in um, we're public now so you know 80 percent of golfers hit a fade or a slice so uh, we made I did a, not know that yeah we made it a lot easier for the average golfer to to play well in this hole um years ago you would almost have to hit a, a draw into here or a straight shot which not many people can hit a straight shot <laughs> we also made the approach area squared and w much wider and there used to be a strip of rough between the approach and the green and now we mow that all the way up to the green into the green basically so it's um just trying to make it a little easier this hole is always really tough and uh it's still a tough hole <laughs> yeah. aren't here anymore yeah a lot of trees have been removed and that uh seems to be the you know the modern thing to do with golf courses is to remove old golf courses is to remove trees and um i i think they've done a really wonderful job i mean they've uh you know they've cleaned up some areas they've taken trees out where you had to negotiate a tree even if your ball was in the fairway and mm -hmm. uh I think that uh, it was pretty dramatic when you saw all those trees going down, mm -hmm. but uh, when you see the result, I think it's all yeah. quite positive. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, make, it makes, makes a difference because, like you say, they, they grow, and you can cut back a few limbs here and there, but that doesn't last very long. Yeah, I think in terms of, if you talk about growth, the, uh, at one point, for 150 yard markers, they put little pine trees in on each side of the fairway, <laughs> and they, they were, you know, about two feet tall when yeah. they were planted. And uh, and then, at, you know, after a while, they got to be maybe 30 or 40 feet tall. And that's they, a that's a new one. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. So you're getting ready to go play pretty soon. So we we don't want to keep you much longer, but. If you had to tell somebody who knew nothing about this course, how would you describe it to them? Well, I would I would say you're going to like it, <laughs> uh, and I think you're going to like uh, you know playing here, and you're going to enjoy the people that are here, and uh, um, and if you want uh, you know a nice. Uh, you know, sandwich or salad, you can get that after you play as well. Um, but I think Washington has always been welcoming, and I think it continues to be, and uh, it, uh, it's a real, real asset for the community. Um, and sometimes I don't know if the community as a whole recognizes that, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a great asset for the Ypsilanti area. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim Nelson, I think you're an asset to the community. <laughs> So okay. thank you so much for telling us the story here. Well, thank, thank you. I appreciate having the chance.